Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study today, Saturday, June 20th, 2015. And today, Shahida is moderating. Go ahead, Shahida. You're on mute if you're speaking. Can you hear me now? Now I can. Thank you. Yes. Now I can. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we're going to start with our quote from Mary Baker. Ready? God is the consuming fire. He separates the dross from the gold, purifies the human character through the furnace of affliction. Those who bear fruit, he purges. They that may bear more fruit, that they may bear more fruit. Through the sacred law, he speaketh to the unfruitful in tones of Sinai. And in the gospel, he sets up the barren fig tree, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? God is our father and our mother, our, mist, our minister and the great physician. He is man's only real relative on earth and in heaven. David sang, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. This is from miscellaneous writing, page 150 to 151. Thank you. The topic of our study today is anything too hard for the Lord. And our first question comes straight from our lesson from Revelation. What does it mean to be created for God's pleasure? Um, I thought that uh, Gary's um, contribution to the forum uh, covered that when he was talking about that God loved us so much that he created us. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of hard to put into words a purely divine concept. I mean, <laughs> who could ever know why God created us <laughs> except God? But it does give us insight into our relationship with God that we're here as a result of divine law. We have a divine purpose. Very encouraging to know that we have a purpose. And well, and it's, I think it's a, it's a beautiful thought to think that God takes pleasure in us. You know that that's a, that's a, a aspect of love, perhaps. You know, if you have a, a child or a pet or anything, something that you love, you take pleasure in it, don't you? Just love it. You love. You're it. doing yeah. right. Yes. I think you know to do I found that encouraging the idea that. God did not make us, uh, God made us for a purpose, for his purpose. We're not just here by chance. Thank you. Bart, were you saying? Well, I was saying, uh, I think that uh, if we are doing his will, um, if we are here for his purpose, I'm sure it's only for good. So if we're doing his will, of course, he'll be, he will take pleasure in seeing us, I think somewhere in the Bible doesn't say we are his witnesses. Um, in what way are we being this witness? Are we uh, being his nature as we should be? Well, um, we are God's very expression. Oh, there would be, God would be a non-entity, as Mrs. Eddy says, without his expression. Thank you. I saw somewhere where it said that God uniquely designed us. Good. That's good because each one of us is indeed unique. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. No two alike. But I like what uh, Florence was uh, was saying that when we when we do the will of God. That's what that's what gives us purpose. I mean, we can feel. Can't 
can't you feel that you've got a purpose when you're doing the right thing? Yes, there's joy. There's joy when you're doing God's yeah. purpose. Yeah, and there's too. Yeah, and there's joy that nobody can ever take away from you. And there's a peace that nobody can ever take from you. No matter what the outside circumstances might seem to be humanly. Yeah, an important thing we, we were taught here is that you have what we call a divine destiny. That's God's plan for you. It's, it's a divine destiny. Something very specific and unique, each one. And when you find that, it, it brings great joy, great peace, great happiness. Not without trial, but um, you feel a sense of fulfillment. The other, the human destiny, what is that? That's worldly success. I mean, right. if you want to say that, if you're working toward that. Yeah. It's, it's human will. It, 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 it's stuff that goes in and out of favor. Important to, among other human beings. Yeah, it's important one day and it's unimportant the next. And, and full of and word, it, sorry. worldly success can sometimes be a question mark after that. <laughs> Go ahead, Lars. No, it's full of uh, uncertainty and uh, mad ambition. I want to be this. I want to be that. <laughs> All of that. There's no, there's no steady peace in that, and there's no satisfaction really, or contentment, I should say. That's right. Um, yeah. I want to thank you for telling us about the spiritual journey of George Washington. I went. I got that book, and it says in there that George Washington had greater peace and joy than anyone else, and it was due to his just following God and listening to God only, no matter what happened. Yes, right. People that have achieved a great deal in on this earth have, have found their divine destiny. Church, uh, Winston Churchill said once he felt he had a divine destiny, something he had to fulfill. And he had, and when, he had similar experiences to George Washington. You know, he was, he was at the front of a lot of battles. And not... And protected. And protected. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that George Washington was in the midst of the fighting in the revolution, and uh, it was noticeable that things would, you know, uh, things would come at him, you know, the enemy, but he would always somehow it would elude him. That's right. But I read last week. But he had a sense of his divine purpose, and he had a respect for he God. Had a respect for God. Um, someone has their computer on. Please turn it off or mute it. We're getting an echo when you have your computer on. I was saying George Washington had a sense of his divine purpose, and he had he had a, a strong enough faith in God that God was able to use him. can't help but think of George Washington's experience with awe because who but God could have carried it through. And the human destiny is, is the Adam dream. It might sometimes seem right. Maybe you think you're getting worldly success, but you're in, if it's godless, it's the Adam dream. And it will end poorly. It always does. So to never be impressed by that. People need to be awakened from it. And, and in the Adam dream, it's from problem to problem, not from glory to glory. In, in science, in your divine destiny, you go from glory to glory. You might have problems. George Washington certainly did. Mary Baker Eddy did. Winston Churchill did. Christ Jesus, of course, did. You've got problems, but you've got something tremendous to meet them with, to overcome them and to grow higher from it. That's your divine destiny. So ask yourself, are you living in your divine destiny? 
um, if you if you're knowing God better, you are. Has anybody is, ever read the book The Light and the Glory? It's about um, the founding of the United States, the Pilgrims, and all that with specific people. They're all the famous people, which I can't remember right now. But it has. It's all recorded in the Library of Congress, and these guys did amazing research. And uh, it's all from people's journals and diaries. And every time something would go wrong for them, everybody would go into full prayer mode. They would fast and they would pray until they got past it together. And that was the founding of our country. It's a wonderful book. What's it called? The Light and the Glory. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. This country's founding was not an accident. Boy, you got that right. Yeah, Bruce was reading the Mayflower recently about the, the Mayflower and how they came for religious freedom and, and the trials and troubles. But, but there again, a divine destiny created for his pleasure so his plan unfolds. And he delights in those who are expressing him, reflecting him. So anyone else on that? Or we should probably move on. But it's an important point. Thank you, Shahida. One other thing. I found it interesting. I looked up lots of commentaries, and nobody really had anything to say about it. And and even Red, Reverend Kratzner had nothing to say about that. And I, I just think it's interesting that uh, really nobody ever knew anything, what Revelation really meant until Mary Baker Eddy defined it. Absolutely. And she came well, off in the New World. It could never have come anywhere but here. That's right. It took this, this atmosphere of freedom for the, to be the cradle of Christian science. It was all part of an unfoldment, all part of a divine plan. And even even humanly speaking, uh, many historians have said that the American Revolution was the only real revolution. It was the only real change in, uh, uh, in the form of human government. Um, you know, there are a lot of a lot of uh, wars uh, in history that are called revolutions, you know, the French Revolution. But the American Revolution brought a whole different form of government based on God, the first one ever in the history of the world. And the Founding Fathers said that it, if, we, you know, it, it is based on God, and if we ever stop <laughs> worshiping God, freedom will go as well. It's a very important point to understand and to teach your children or grandchildren or neighbors or whoever else. Um, and this is where we stand today, to preserve our rights. They're God-given, but tyranny, when the human mind takes over, tyranny takes over. It's the nature of the beast. Someone is crinkling their papers very loudly. <laughs> Think about what other country in the world has um, any reference to Almighty Providence in their founding papers of their organization, other than the United States. I don't think there are any. And it was George Washington who first started the Thanksgiving Day service, and it's continued ever since. And to give you an idea of how Air would like to try to annul it, and it seems like it's always watching and trying, back in those days of the revolution when they finally won, they wanted to make George Washington a king. Some people did. Yeah. Some people did. A few. So even in the midst of all that, that they'd been through and achieved and got to that point, somebody wanted to throw this idea in there, let's make George Washington a king. Through his infinite wisdom, however, he declined and knew that it was wrong. Yes, he had a humility. He could never have done what he did if he wasn't so humble. Uh, a less humble man may, might have taken that bait. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I'll be king. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
after he had so many successes. Um, but he, he always remained humble before God. That's a large part of his greatness, his humility. Okay. How are we doing, Shari? Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next question. Great discussion. Uh, so we'll move on to the story of Abraham. What was God's promise to Abraham concerning his seed or his offspring? God promised Abraham in several sections of Genesis. I added one here, just Genesis 15. And if you would like to tell us what he, God said? Um, His descendants to... would be God's people. Go ahead, repeat that again. His descendants would be God's people. Mm -hmm. and, and Betty, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say the way he had him look up at the sky, look up at the, toward the heavens and see the stars. Um, and thou shalt, if thou shalt be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. Yeah, there'd be more in number than the stars. I, I love that story. It reminds me Amazing. of... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, that's amazing imagery. It's amazing imagery. And it reminds me of when I first came to this church and Mrs. Evans was teaching me and the others. And I had a very narrow outlook on so many things. I still remember her saying right now, think big. You want to get something, an idea from God? Well, let's approximate to some degree of what God is, who happens to be infinite. Let's think big. After all, the right is more powerful than all the limitations that get imposed on people. So like God who told Abraham to look up at the sky and count all those stars. So here we are here. We have so much going for us. And to think big is uh, very useful. It's been very useful to me. Anybody else? Shahira, do you want to say anything more? Before God told Abraham that Abraham was not thinking big, we'll see. What was he commenting on before that? He was concerned about who was going to be his heir, and it was exactly. He hadn't had any children yet. And he was getting, you know, he'd, he'd been around for quite a while. Did <laughs> he get a little nervous? And, and Sarah had been around for a long time as well. He said one more thing that I thought was kind of interesting uh, about his seed. And it wasn't, I, I'd be interested if anybody has a clear explanation for it. He said that they would be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. They'd be in captivity for 400 years. They'd come out of captivity with great substance. Anybody have any idea what that's all about? It's in Egypt. They are slavery in Egypt, no? Well, that's, what I, that's the only thing I could think that's of. That's what I think. He, he, he was telling them, he was giving him the next 400 years of future. That's a fairly precious gift to be given that kind of prophecy, so accurately stated at least. Well, that's such a cheery prophecy, however. <laughs> <laughs> well, however, think about it. You know, they were in captivity in Egypt for a long, long time. Having this prophecy must have been encouraging to somebody when they were in captivity. And it said they would come forth with yes. substance. Yes. So that was the that was the good part about it. And probably after all their captivity, all their trials, that taught them true substance. It is not found in material things but in God. You know, even the um, experience of the uh, people, the, the black people in our country who uh, went under slavery, they, they have so much substance that uh, website we have, 
can't think of the man's name, but anyway, the, the gospel singer who talks about his ancestry coming through slavery, it, it forced them to God. In, in ways, I mean, it, it was the white people that needed to be pitied because they were so full of themselves and their materiality while while many of the slaves were gaining in, in a tremendous amount of substance. Go ahead. So our next yes. question. Okay. Nahor. Abraham's brother. Nahor. Who was Nahor? That turned out to be the most interesting question. Um, it was Abraham's older brother. And he's, uh, let's see, he's first mentioned in the genealogy in Genesis 11. He was also Terah's father, so there were two of them. One Abraham's grandfather and one his brother. And he, he married his brother Haran's daughter, Milka. Haran had died in the land of their nativity, Ur of the Chaldees. Rebecca was the granddaughter of Milka and Nahor. And Rachel is the daughter of Laban, son of Nahor. It's a very close family. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> very close. Well, I think I think uh, Rachel is. Isn't Rachel the daughter of Laban? Yes. Who's the son of? Yes. Who's the grandson right. of Nahor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, right, right, right. Laban. Son, grandson, one of those. Either way, it was a close family. Talk about marrying your cousin. You know, it's interesting. You can see how um, uh, um, old Abraham and Sarah were when Isaac was born, because. Uh, Isaac was the son of Abraham, but he married the granddaughter of Nahor. They may not, they probably were similar ages, but because uh, um, Isaac was born so late, um, um, I presume he's about the same age as the granddaughter of this Abraham's brother. Yeah, good point. I read it was Nahor who instructed Abraham to leave his native land and go to Canaan. And they'd all been born and raised in the city of Ur. Well, you know this. This uh, um, um, going back to your um, where your to your family to find a wife reminds me of my ancestor. One of my ancestors. Um, went to the wilderness, and when he uh, wanted to get married, he went back home to uh, Missouri and found a wife. And then he went back to the wilderness, and, um, and she died. So uh, he went back to Missouri again and found a second wife, and then took her to the wilderness. Missouri, huh? Wilderness. Well, Missouri That's was home. What wilderness? <laughs> <laughs> From Missouri to the wilderness. That's right. From Missouri to the wilderness. Okay. Well, his first wife died of fright from some from some Native American. So, right. Yeah, it was for a wilderness, obviously. So. <laughs> well, why did he go there again? Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's an easy way to get rid of one's wife. <laughs> Frightened folks. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Thanks a lot of people that, at this time, they, they would marry, uh, you know, probably some, uh, some woman from some local Native American tribe, you know? But he went back to Missouri. Twice. Twice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I could see that if he was from Texas. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank okay. you, Tom. We're going to continue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Abraham's wife, I pronounce the name Sarai. That's nice. How's, how does it What do you all think? I th uh, it's very, yeah. it's very, uh, it's a short eye. Oh, boy, we, we, have, we have multiple okay, pronunciations. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it's a long eye. If you look at that Harper Collins down at the bottom of the page where uh, it, it shows the, you know, whatever they call that, it's eye like in sky, it says. Yes, there he is. Just Sarai. Sarai. The, the second A is also long. <laughs> I think it was too confusing, and that's why I was changing Sarah. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, a, there's probably a lot of different dictionaries that put it a lot of ways because nobody really knows. The um, I just looked it up in a Bible dictionary, and Sarah I is my princess, where Sarah is princess. So there's a slight difference. That's interesting. Well, I think God took pity on her that nobody could pronounce her name properly. <laughs> <laughs> she went from well, my you know, to just princess, right? Nobody had any possessive claim on her any longer. She belonged to God, right? Well, I, I read she had three names. The first one, Yeg Shao, which she meant to gaze upon. The second, Sarai, which was princess. And, and then the final, Sarah, which meant given given to her by God. So it showed spiritual development. What was the first one, Ken? Well, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Y-E-S-C-H-A-H. Yeshel. Yeshel. I found that as well. And this. Process the English Okay, right. So, yeah. so I guess tomorrow we're going to find the right way to pronounce it? <laughs> That's your homework. Well, well someone's it. going to be reading tomorrow in church, so uh, uh, yeah, that's when the decision will be made. Yeah. Not to put any pressure on Fairly in any way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have found this lesson challenging for pron pronunciation. It's the most challenging I've seen. <laughs> Well, I read commentaries by people whose name was Sarai, and they, they said how differently it was pronounced, and so I guess almost anything goes. So, was there a point to this question, Tom? <laughs> uh, was there a point? Well, we read it, so it'd be interesting to know how to pronounce it. Okay. That's it. Okay. okay. All right. So now, now, now we come up with at least three different ways to pronounce it. So um, we'll be very democratic and can pick your own method. So fairly, it's all yours. Well, I'll listen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Shall we go on? Yes. Yeah, so Sarai. I'm going to keep saying Sarai. <laughs> was barren initially. What does barren mean? Infertile. Not fertile. Unproductive. Non bearing fruit. Not producing or unproductive. And incapable of producing offspring. But I'd, I'd like to suggest that this is just the effect of the real meaning of barren. And I might want to suggest maybe inactivity or in need of progress or something like that. There's uh, something more to the root of the matter. We, we speak of barren lives. Yeah. Oh. Yes, that's deep. You know, when, when I thought of this, I was thinking about what was in the lesson in Science and Health. It's, Mary Baker Eddy wrote, our aim must be to have them understood spiritually, them meaning the scriptures, for only by this understanding can truth be gained. So when we think of the word barren, we can think of what we read in Webster's, 
but uh, also I, I was thinking, like, what does Baron mean when we think of uh, the story that we're reading in, in the Bible? Um, I mean, in other words, like, was was there any change when she was barren until when she was not barren? Or is it just physical? Well, just like Mary said, it's a spiritual uh, growth. She, from those different names, it's a progression. So, that's the way I see it. And they saw, and God was, and God was said to be, uh, letting this happen. I mean, was leading this to come about. Perhaps it was a, a form of purging. The no, I mean, you know, when the ch children were coming forth, it was God's hand. Yeah. I was thinking the the, uh, the birth of her son was like a physical manifestation of the change in her spiritually. And the change in Abraham. Yeah, I mean, in, in those days, you know, women didn't have their remaining rights. And society um, imposed, I guess, if you will, the idea on all women that their primary purpose in life was to bear children and that their life would be more secure if they had at least one son to care for them because sons could own property and women and daughters couldn't so having a child having a son in those days was a really really big deal and the idea of being barren when you spiritualize that whole thing. Where, where do sons, where do children come from anyway? They don't come from, you know, physical act of sex. They come from God, and they belong to God. And in this case, Abraham and maybe more than Sarah, but Abraham and Sarah had to come to a total dependence upon God for that to happen. And their total dependence upon God gave them a higher spirituality than anybody else on earth that we know of it's been recorded anyway and that's how God was able to use them to produce you know a great nation that would carry the Christ spirit if you will to mankind so there was a significant change and that was in in their extremity they turned to God in prayer and that was the change in their extremity was God's opportunity and you know the, this is a, a lesson for us today uh, when we're feeling barren in any way whether it's a, a lack of a lack of anything uh, let that turn us to God more wholeheartedly to fill the void and he will fill the void in whatever way is, is right and needful for you um, Mrs. Eddy speaks about in Science and Health uh, in the chapter Prayer, while the heart is far from divine truth and love, we cannot conceal the ingratitude of barren lives. So, this is a, a wonderful and a re relevant example of how to come over a sense of barrenness. Turn to God. You know, all these uh, ways now people are t turning to to get children when they feel that they can't have children, uh, all these ways. But how much better if they got on their knees and turned to God, and, and God, God answers prayer. And these are certainly examples of it. 
I have an example from my own experience about this. I had a friend whose wedding I was in, and she couldn't have children, apparently. But she simply turned to prayer. She had grown up in the church, not the Christian Science Church. And ten years later, she had two children. It, it happened many times. I'd like to just interject because I feel this is important here. I, I've given it before, but it's worth repeating. It's Isaiah 54, that chapter 1, Sing, O barren, you who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. It goes on the whole chapter. But in the amplified version of that, um, it says this. Although this chapter is primarily intended to express Zion's joy over redemption, it has also a very personal, long-neglected, and often overlooked message for women. The lonely, the disappointed, the childless, the widow. It has all the glorious confidence and insurance, assurance, the incentive and understanding for which feminine hearts have longed for throughout the ages. Every woman who will read it every week for a year with receptive heart and mind will find herself not only spiritually prepared, um, but she will also be supplied with rich treasure with, with which to address similar needs of countless other aching hearts to whom the Holy Spirit is here speaking. I would say that's a wonderful thought and a wonderful promise. Uh, to those, and there are those that just as in, in years ago, these people felt wounded, these women, because they were widows or childless, they didn't have children. But this is a promise in Isaiah, and what he's saying is that your husband is God, and we all have to have that relationship. We all have to feel the comfort of God and to know that He is our Creator. And if we get into the sense of that, we will no longer have the sense of loneliness, barrenness, whatever else it's trying to suggest. So I put that forth. I, I thought it was a good good thing to think about because I know in the practice I deal with women who sometimes are feeling that way. Says to read this once every month, chapter 34 in Isaiah. I'm oh, sorry, 54 in Isaiah. I forget what biography it was, but Mrs. Eddy uh, opened to that one day. I think it was when she was uh, bringing forth science and health and, and found great comfort in that. And, you know, the first time I read it, she says, to those leaning on the sustaining infinite, today is big with blessings. And she starts out with that. And even then, in my youth, I had read lots of old books, and they always talked about women being big with child. They never said pregnant. And I, and that's how I related that. Oh, big with blessings, pregnant with possibilities and blessings. Good. Very good. <laughs> and that's what it is. It doesn't have to, certainly doesn't have to be a child. It can be big with blessings, all kinds of blessings. God is the only cause and creator, and that's what the lesson is about. Thank you okay. so much for what that. I, what I find interesting is that I get this from Mrs. Addy's reading, or writings, I'm sorry, that uh, in spite of the non-status that women were accorded, they were actually, it was their spiritual spirituality and mentality that set the tone for the future generations of the offspring of the Virgin Mary and to have the idea for the pure Christ. Thank you. Absolutely. That's, that's a very good point. When you go through the history of the kings that Israel had at the time, the good kings had a mother who was highly moral and spiritually minded. The bad kings you know, didn't have <laughs> didn't have a very good mother <laughs> that way. So that's a very good point. Okay, Shahida, how are we doing? Uh, okay, let's go to our next few questions here. Joseph, in the glossary, in the glossary of science and health, there is a definition of Joseph. Can anybody look that up? A corporeal mortal a higher sense of truth rebuking mortal belief or error, 
and showing the immortality and supremacy of truth. Pure affection blessing its enemies. That's it. That's it. That's it. And here again, it shows progression, doesn't it? Starting out with a corporeal mortal and then ending up with pure affection blessing its enemies. Spiritual progress. Putting off the old man for the new. Good example, isn't it? Can I ask yourself, do you bless your enemies? Do you have any enemies? Do you know what Mrs. Eddie says about that? Yes. Yeah. Something you formulate in your own thought, and then you look out on your object of your own creating. <laughs> She also says, love them or you won't lose them. What was that? She also says, to love them or you won't lose them. Yes. Right. Thank you. Pretty clear that they're here for a purpose. Love them or you won't lose them. The purpose being to try us and so we can purify our thought because when the lesson is learned, those objects that we call enemies cease to exist it fulfilled their purpose that's right and so it is okay. is there another question yeah i guess so tom did you want to say anything about that oh that's good okay good Go ahead, Shahida. I mean, I guess uh, the reason I had partly had it in there was, um, you know, think about uh, what Mary Baker Ray said about uh, Joseph, and then next question is about Joseph's mother. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. In some way, think of those together. Yeah, right. Okay, Shahida. But Joseph's mother was the second wife. Is that right? Well, she was married with her sister. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Hard to keep it all up. <laughs> well, she was first choice, second wife. Okay, that's yeah. what I'm trying to say, yes. Thank you. Yeah, first choice, second wife. First. Right. Who, who initially was barren. Yeah, so her sister Leah had was having sons left, right, and center, and she did not. Correct. <laughs> she continued to be envious of Leah. I I read something in the Zondervan um, Bible um, commentary that I'd like to share. Thank you. Please. Um, it said, Poor childless Rachel was not forgotten by the Lord, for he remembered her and opened her womb. She gave birth to a son and thereby took away her reproach. The grateful mother became a prophetess, for she called her baby Joseph, which means the Lord shall add to me another son, which was not merely the language of desire, but the prediction of a seer. Of all the children of Jacob, Joseph became the godliest and greatest. Renowned as the Savior of Israel, he stands out as the most perfect type in the Bible of him who was born of woman to become the Savior of the world. That's beautiful. Thank you, Suzanne. Very good. So, R Rachel was highly spiritually minded in her extremity. She found God and gave birth to Joseph. Highly spiritually minded. So she couldn't have done that if she was harboring uh, resentment toward her sister. It would have been impossible. It's such an important lesson 
you know, if you, you raise your hand against yourself, if you continue the resentment, if you continue chewing over things, you only harm yourself. And I'm sure she wouldn't have done at this tremendous blessing of Joseph if she had continued being jealous. She got over it. However, it does appear that Leah continued to be envious. Yeah. Um, there's what? a verse in there that says, uh, and Rachel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. Which indicates that she dealt with it. Yeah, she, she wrestled with a false sense of her sister and got over it. Yeah, and that's always what it is. It's not person, it's a false sense. And you know, another thing Mrs. Evans would teach us here with, with children, especially if you had a second child, to handle even before they're born, the sibling rivalry. It's a belief. It doesn't have to be all of this, uh, you know, rivalry that goes on in families and between brothers and sisters. Of course, it went on with Joseph because all his brothers were jealous of him and threw him in a pit. So that's why it needs to be seen, exposed, and handled as a, a lie, a bloody lie, not the truth about God's creation. He loves us all equally, and we're all in the family of God, one family, one brotherhood, one sisterhood, no division of, of anything, of race or creed, anything like that. We're all in the, a family of God. We all have the same mother and father. And we treat each other with that same respect and love. And so that's the basis of science. But you can see where the children reflected their mother's thought, because Leah continued to be of kind of this rivalry. <laughs> And it was her children that put Joseph in the pit. And, and Joseph overcame it all. It's a tremendous story. As did Rachel. As did Rachel. They did not hate. They would not hate. It's so touching when people, we've seen it recently in the news, when people have had terrible things seem to happen to them, and yet they refuse to hate. That's taking the high road. And it is their safety. It is their safety. Yes, it is. And in the lesson in the responsive reading, it says, God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Thank you. Together. That's one point. The other thing is that uh, to begin with, Rachel was the loved one, but the only way uh, Leah became in between there was through man-made doctrines because uh, it was all uh, <laughs> because she had to be the first one because she was the oldest so the whole thing became a scam <clears throat> and uh, so it was uh, the sorting through of you know the irony was that Leo was kind of done a favor but Rachel stayed pure and then was the uh, uh, one that had the good family. Yeah. Rachel had lots of opportunity to be resentful, but she did not. Right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Lots of opportunity. She did go there. <laughs> Nor should we. I will say one thing about Rachel. At the beginning, it, it was a little surprising to me. Uh, she, she did, of course, envy her sister, but she said, give me children or else I die. Yep. And then God remembered Rachel. She, she, her prayer was passionate. She wasn't lukewarm. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and that was the belief at the time. If a woman didn't have a have a have a son, she was destined to a pretty miserable life. Yeah. I mean, it was. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't any welfare going on in those days. <laughs> right. Let's move on to our last question. 
We've got about 10 minutes left. Go ahead, Jeremy had one more question. I just was wondering if that would Go be ahead. the case, demanding the blessing. Oh, right. Good point. Demanding the blessing. Bringing it to fruition. Bringing it all the way to produce harmonious results. Not getting stuck halfway, but bringing it all the way through. Okay, Shahida. So, Rachel gave birth to Joseph, and her, her husband, Jacob, was... Well, whose who son was Jacob? Rebecca. Rebecca. Right. Rebecca. And then we had... I said his mother was Sarah. I, Sarah. Sarah. So between Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, what is common link besides all being descendants of Abraham? What's more about their births? They were all barren. Yeah, they were all forced to go to God. The cost they were such significant figures that it took a great deal to bring them forth in in this world. Well, that's a yes. good point, too. They, yes. All the women were very special women in this case. Um, the way that Rebecca was picked to be Isaac's wife indicated that she already had a high degree of spirituality. And... Um, and so, in a sense, when the quote at the very beginning about the purges that they may bear more fruit, and I thought they were, um, they had to go up even higher in order to produce, um, to, uh, in order to have that offspring that was spiritual minded. I, I'm sure that's true. Something more was being required of them. Because they could do it. Yeah. Didn't just happen. That's why we must never despair if things don't work out right away. Um, maybe just more is required of us, and maybe the blessing will be more. Uh, so don't despair if things don't work out right away. Work more diligently. Pray more sincerely. And... Uh, and what can come forth will be tremendous. When things just happen too easily, maybe you don't earn them. Or anyway, it's, it's a good point. Because I, it is odd that all three of these women were barren, and all three of them gave birth to something significant. Well, well, that's the point, considering as we started up our study, Abraham was promised that his seed would, would be more numerous to count. Yes. Anyone else? Did everyone speak their mind? Well, if no one else has something to add, back at the Baron, I really loved the statement in the lesson where it says, I, um, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And I looked up womb, and it was interesting. Uh, it's really a place where something's generated to hold in secret within inward parts feelings. And I thought, really, that's like our thought. And here, God will open that and take away our reproach. Beautiful. That's a lovely thought. Yes. Thank you. Linda. Thank you. Because first, there, there her heart had to be open to God, wide open. And what? And oftentimes it, it takes a, a traumatic experience or a desperate feeling to open our hearts to God, doesn't it? You know? Yes, I'm, definitely. Yeah. I think that's what happens, you know, in, in that, well, in a so-called delayed healing something is required there's more more commitment to to the love of God you know just take eyes off the appearance and to seek him more something is something more is required and when that happens then of course your thought is open enough mm -hmm. 
Thank you. That's a beautiful explanation. And, and God is pouring forth all blessing. In truth, you're perfect now, but you've got to be able to see it, be receptive to it. So if you're not getting this, whatever it is you're seeking, it, it, you need more receptivity to it. Put down the walls. I know for me, it's often been a good thing for me to feel totally helpless before God. Because when I get to that point, I've uh, released whatever it is that's going to interfere with the true idea coming forth. There it is. All the obstructions are out of the way. Getting myself out of the way. That's it. Getting self out of the way. To let God and His purpose shine through you. His purpose. My will be done. Which goes back to the beginning. Where we are created for Him. For His pleasure. For His pleasure. Before we close the day, I've How much time had anything, Tom? Before we move on? Well, actually, sure. that's the last, last question. Did you want to say something? Shahida, did you want to add anything? Or Tom? I was asking Tom, because Tom was help, helpful in doing these okay. questions this week. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, so what are you asking? <laughs> if you had anything to add. Oh, no, I think it was a wonderful discussion, so... Uh, yeah. Well, I'd like, I'd like to say before closing, I, I've spoken to a few of you, but uh, the month of July and August, we'll take a break from the Bible study. If, if anyone feels very, very strongly about doing a, a Bible study, they certainly can notify Tom um, and or Linda, and we can. But um, in the meantime, we'll just take a break. I, no one so far has volunteered for next, the last... Saturday in, in June. I'll take the last Saturday if nobody else uh, wants to. Um, we can wait if there's a volunteer. Otherwise, I'll put some questions together. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so great. Well, thank you. Good, good session. Thank you so much, Shahidat and Tom. Yeah, thank you, Shahidat. Good, good job. Thank great you. Great session. Good answer. Thank, thank you, Shahidat.